particularly those who think food justice is important to think about the intersections there because that has a tremendous impact and there are a whole host of policies that impact whether folks actually can make the right choices. I wanted to make, uh, we'll go to the questions in a minute. I wanted to make two observations uh, uh, that I think are important to understand. One of them is even if you win something that looks like it's a success today, there's a need for a continuous struggle. Because what you think <coughs> occurs today that's positive may arose tomorrow or the year after or two years after. For many years, uh, Williamsburg was stable. It then reached a crisis point and then it flipped. And it was when people let up on the struggle uh, that it really went, underwent a dramatic change. And uh, it, it, I think it dresses ourselves, as it forces to understand that winning something doesn't mean you won it permanently. So organizing has to be an ongoing struggle and keeping uh, the goals clearly in one's mind, I think, are critically important. The idea of generating something locally a success locally. Some people think, well, that becomes isolated. But Ray, uh, the National People's Action, as I was around when it first emerged, uh, uh, with Gail Sincata out in Chicago, when this woman was concerned about the fact that banks were disinvesting in her community, began to organize her neighbors to protest the bank redlining that occurred in that section of Chicago. And what happened was she was arrested, she was put out of the bank because she was trespassing. She then organized that community to go to the bank and open up bank accounts for one dollar. And she created such a mess in that <laughs> bank, they couldn't function, that they sat down and negotiated with her. When she did that in Chicago, it was replicated in Philadelphia, it was replicated in Williamsburg, it then went across the country and then led to two programs on a national level, the Community Reinvestment Act and then uh, and the more Disclosure Act actually before it. So that you really had to give information and then you had to refer them to the event. That was quite successful for many years because it put money in communities that had been disinvested. Today that CRA needs to be revisited because why should money go into communities like Sunset Park and others where it's targeted by neighborhood, but not by the beneficiary. So the money today is coming in and is funding a lot of the displacement that's occurring. So it was really good in the 60s and the 70s and mid-70s, and a fundamental change really had to be readdressed, I think, in today's world. So that we have to go and redefine who benefits from community reinvestment. Not a geographic area, but low-income families. Maria mentioned the so-called low-income housing. We no longer talk about building low-cost housing for people so it's affordable. We talk about affordability, which is a vague and I think ominous term because it, it's not something that people in the neighborhood can afford. So I just wanted to point out that organizing on a local level, coming up with examples, can multiply its impact not only around the country but around the world. But it's not winning only once. It's sustaining that effort and organizing that effort. And the last comment I want to make before we go back to questions is I have been impressed every time that Elizabeth invites me to meet with some of the young kids at Uprose. I get the same sort of thrill when I meet the kids at El Puente. And I see kids who are involved and engaged in environmental justice issues. I go up to Los Cadamos, uh, I knew it when it got started. And I see there, again, the way it's been able to renew. So I don't give up on the next generation. I really think that you know, the next generation probably has the most ominous challenge to deal with climate change. They may not know it, but they must deal with it. But that challenge is also an enormous opportunity to use creativity and energy. But it's really built upon working and partnering and learning from people like the four people who are talking to us today. I feel like Mike dropped, right? When everyone talks, it's like, okay, we're done. Mike dropped. There was a question about that. Yes. Sorry, I'm going to pass this back up. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Um, hi. Hello. Can we talk kind of this idea of displacement? Maybe Sunset Park, maybe not. Just so, <laughs> because you, I know you were concer
too much, but um, I'm just trying to be fair because yeah, there's no, so many it, communities and so many issues. It's a really interesting example. I don't know that much about it personally. Um, but when you're looking at possibilities for not displacing people and yet improving a community, especially in light of climate change, you know, there are things that are debatable whether they're an improvement, whether a community wants them or not, but when it comes to really protecting you from the ocean and things like that, they really need to be done. Improvements to infrastructure, things that need to happen. Um, I heard an anecdote not related to as a crucial of infrastructure as that, but that, you know, when they had the Million Trees program, that they would go to communities and say, you want a tree? And they said, we don't want a tree. It's like, why don't we want a tree? Oh, because gentrification. For me, that was sort of sad, like, well, it's sad to me that you have to say we don't want a tree because we don't want gentrification. Like maybe you would like to try have a tree, but not the gentrification that comes with the tree. So what kind of I guess for I don't you know maybe from a policy side what tools maybe from a community side what are the ideas that can kind of allow I know we've talked about this in vague terms, but maybe what what you gather from the communities when you do talk to them what could be these possibilities for preventing displacement yet allowing community to flourish, to replace its industrial park with a better one, to replace, to have trees, to have infrastructure, but not get displaced because of the real estate market. Well, you know, um, before the one million trees campaign, of course, had an aggressive urban forestry campaign, and if you come to our office, you'll see uh, that those trees have matured, and we planted trees from 15th Street all the way down to 65th Street and we put that in down to the waterfront and in front of all of those trees there are no longer people of color living. And I will tell you that um, we have had people who say they want to live, they'd rather live next to a waste transfer station or a power plant because it means that they can afford to live there. And that developers have used our successes, the fact that we've doubled the amount of open space that we've gotten, a waterfront park that we have, to basically promote displacement in our community. Uh, and so not only do we endure it, not only do we breathe it, not only do we have the health impacts as a result of all of the toxins that exist in our community, but the minute we reclaim it, we lose our homes. And so, um, so our, our, uh, I, our idea, our premise is that if we can retain the industrial work of the waterfront, we can make it, keep it blue collar, and if that working waterfront can address the issue of climate change, that we will be able to keep our community because people feel entitled to move into our community, just like they've always felt entitled to take whatever they put. This build, this nation is built on takings. Uh, and so it is continuous over time. And the minute that you make it beautiful, you lose it. And so the incentive to get our communities meaningfully engaged in this starts dissipating as a result of the implications of that, that real situation. So. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm a second semester placemaking student at Pratt and also a fellow at Nosca Dalmos with the New Jobs group. Um, I have a follow-up to this discussion in particular uh, in terms of uh, thinking about staving off development and really like empowering communities. do people feel like community development corporations and that sort of infrastructure is and then uh, I think that's broader than just CDC's but that kind of community development institutionalized infrastructure but then also whether some of the tools that are often used by CDC's like uh, landmarking 
are useful in sort of preventing gentrification uh, sure. and displacement. And how policy, what kind of policies yeah. exist for the land, that landmarking process? Yeah, so I mean, I, I live in a landmark neighborhood, and I, I uh, took days off work to protest against it. Uh, and, uh, and I live, live there, and I've lived there pretty much my entire life. Uh, and if I lost the apartment I'm in now, I could not afford to live there. Right? Uh, I oppose landmarking, and I think it gets at some of the issues we're, we're getting at, not just landmarking. Because while it, it has some benefits for some people, right, it actually makes it harder to afford to live there. Right? Landmarking dramatically raises the cost of doing repairs. So particularly for folks who have had their house a long time, and have seen the value go up, but often are living on a fixed income or are lower income than the neighborhood already, it, it dramatically exacerbates it. Now, I was particularly sensitive to it because I lived in Sunnyside, was a planned community, and it had a pretty, pretty interesting progressive story behind it. And when they created it, they created a covenant, and they created uh, a district, a special district with rules that protected it. And when they brought in landmarking, they eliminated it. The irony to me is that what made it special as a neighborhood is that there were community gardens. Landmarking does not protect the community gardens, yeah. right? It, it actually makes it harder to protect all of the infrastructure that really makes people's lives better. What it protects is the buildings, right? And the infrastructure that is developed, and, and I think this is not just for landmarking, but for much of the community development space, is there about a particular aspect of space that is not about the people who live there, right? And that's a very important distinction, particularly for those of you in planning and placemaking, right, to think about it. If you make it look nicer, Right? That has a downside. Right? Most of the policy decisions we deal with have downsides. And in our society, right, I, I would like to think Cuba might be different, it is guaranteed that whoever has the least power, and that is almost always poor people of color in our society, is going to be screwed by whatever policy decision you have. And the one exception to that is where the policy decision is to give more power to the people who are normally screwed. Right? That's not a new idea, right? But I think that's a really important one, particularly for those of us who are interested in this question, is if they had talked to old people in my neighborhood, they would have said, we love this neighborhood. I don't really care that that guy painted his house a student color. Right? What they would have said is, it annoys me that the court association no longer lets me have a garden. Right? I can't grow food because my new neighbors don't want it. Right? Those issues are only surface if you actually talk to people. Right? I, I was struck by the, the really interesting question uh, earlier about like why do people not want trees? Part of the problem is that they didn't go in and say, what do you need in your neighborhood, right? They went in and said, you want trees, right? And I'm sure if you started with what do you want in your neighborhood, somewhere down the list, like 25 would be beautiful trees, right? Because trees are really nice, everybody likes them. But right at the top of the list is things like not having my kids get asthma, not getting shot by the police, not being kicked out of the street. And if you don't ask about those issues first, we will never get to the nice things because those things are only going to be provided in a way that actually disempowers the people who need them most. I hope that answers the question. I, I want to respond because I think there are some. I agree with your objective. I have lived long enough to understand that when we had disinvestment in the city and I saw rampant abandonment in the Lower East Side, in East New York, in Harlem, in the South Bronx, in the area around Los Cadamos, that the victims of that disinvestment were poor people. Today, I see the reinvestment creating victims, and those victims are poor people. And so, I've also seen people not go into neighborhoods because they had lousy schools, and they had crime that was rampant in those neighborhoods that affected the people who lived in that neighborhood. And so, I can't accept the paradigm that you can't have good schools, or you can't have healthy neighborhoods, one of the ways of addressing asthma is by planting trees, because a tree takes out a lot of the toxins in the air and helps people breathe. So what we've got to do is go to a new paradigm. The idea of development and improvement should not be based on a philosophy of replacement. It should be based on a philosophy of helping those that reside in that community. So in addition to all of these things, no matter what we do, we can refuse the tree or we plant the tree, the victim is going to be low-income families until we create tenure rights for people who live in buildings, until we create low-cost loans for families that own housing in those areas, until we go back to understanding that housing is a right and not a commodity to be dealt with in our system. So you know, I agree with a lot of what the panelists said. We really need a new ism. And that newism has to be one 
that looks at development, not in terms of new buildings or replacing the people who work there, but of the opportunity for the people who live there to become the next middle income and high income community so that their economy and their opportunities grow. And somehow, we as a group have to take on that challenge because it's a fundamental part of the struggle against climate change. Because you can't divorce anything we've been talking about in this room from that issue. Because uh, who suffers the most? It's the islands you know, that we, you know, we talked about Cuba earlier, or Puerto Rico, and what are dying out there. The, you know, some of the, uh, the water surrounding those areas are already dying. The coral reefs are, are turning. Uh, those islands are very susceptible to climate change. So we've got to fight that issue. It's not only the Rockaways, it's not only the South Bronx, it's not only Sunset Park, but it's, it's everybody. So we've got to deal with how we mitigate uh, as well as how we adapt. And part of the adaptation is using that money to be invested to make our community stronger and use that money to create better communities but safe for the people that live there. If we fight against improvements, then we're really going to hurt the people we're there for. But we have to improve with, uh, there's a Jewish term, seichel, common sense. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Nikita. I'm from Manila, Philippines, and I'm in the Sustainable Environmental System program. And I was just wondering, since um, Ron talked about the mitigation and adaptation, well, in Manila, we have a large um, um, a volume of low-income people who comes in the city from the province to get um, a better job, but then they are the most affected with the climate change. I believe that. But the, my question is, with your role in the society, how can you empower a lower income class, commonly in the slums, and whose prime a priority in grasp of knowledge, knowledge is rooted to simply surviving and having the basic needs of these people? I think that's a good place to start, to surviving. Understanding that we are affected first and worst by climate change is the first step to starting to address the climate crisis. Understanding that there are communities responsible for the climate crisis that do not feel the effects of climate change the same way low-income communities globally feel climate change. That's just, that's the starting point to have the understanding that something has got to change and it's also the starting point to connect all of the issues that come with being from a low income community. I think we've talked a lot about intersectionality today. A lot of folks from low income communities are more concerned with where is their next meal coming from? Are they going to be able to pay their rent on the first of the month? Are they going to be able to put clothes on their children's back? In some countries there is no public edu education, you have to pay something. Are they going to be able to pay for their kids to go to school? Those are the most pressing issues, and when talking to communities most affected by climate change about climate change and the effects of climate change, while there is an understanding that yes, that is one of the other things we have to deal with, it's a little lower on the list, but having the understanding that the same beast that's responsible for all of these struggles that we face on a daily basis is the same beast that is responsible for the climate crisis is understanding that all of these issues are related and you don't have to separate these issues. You don't have to choose what to fight for. Challenging this beast means to be struggling for rights to have a decent wage, rights to access to healthy food, uh, access to transportation or jobs closer to home so you don't have to travel all day to get to work or travel and work during the week and then travel home on, on weekends. Understanding the common cause is the beginning of understanding that you don't have to choose one struggle over the other. It is the same struggle. And then there's the understanding that what do we do to address this? We have to be organized in any community. Organizing, without being organized, there is no way to begin to address these problems. We have to be organized, and I think as Ron said, we have to continue the struggle even after we win victories. It can seem daunting at times. It's wonderful when we achieve a victory, but the struggle is not over. Once we achieve one victory, then we have to continue for the next, and we have to maintain it. Yeah. 
mean, I, would, I don't know that I can add much. I, I think my experience organizing was people are angry, right? And, and if you validate that anger and you say, let's talk about how we make it better, then people are really creative at coming up with solutions. And the first step for me is to say, you know, I, I don't think in many cases walking in and asking, do you want a tree or do you want to fight climate change is the way to do it. Like it's asking folks, how do you want to change this? And then seeing how they want to do it. I also think that some of the organizing networks are like need to be aware of the reality of the people that they're working with. So like when folks are working several jobs and have kids and are just mostly, you know, paying attention to how they live and how they get through the day and through the weeks. Um, it's also, you can't be like, well, if you want to get involved in fixing this thing that impacts you and your community, then you need to come here at 3 o'clock on Wednesday. It's like, we need to have flexible systems within the ways that we work with people, too, and meet people where they're at and not expect them to meet us where we're at. Or like, you know, we're working within breaking systems, and so we can't work within that system that has already, like, been leading to their ongoing oppression, but actually working with you know, creating relationships, making sure that, you know, if you do have meetings, like you have childcare, like I know this sounds really simple, but making it so that folks can afford to come. And, you know, sometimes with volunteer things, like making sure that folks not only have the means to get there, but that the things that they're leaving at home are also taken care of. And so sometimes you're not gonna say like, you know, do you want to fight climate change? If so, this is it. Or like your community is on the front lines of the impacts here, and so get involved with this organizing effort. But it's it's yeah, it's very much like meeting people where they're at and being able to build from there. So we're going to take one more question, Abigail. Yeah, if my question is very much related to what you're talking about. Um, it's about organizing and it's about governance and the connection between how we organize and what that means for the new ism that we're trying to work towards um, and not replicating the old isms in the way that we organize. So um, there's a phrase, if you want to go far, go alone. If you want to go fast, uh, sorry. If you want to go far, go alone. If you want to go, if you want to go fast, go alone. Yeah. It's like one of those. <laughs> if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. But it seems yeah. to me like in this situation, we need to, that's fine, but we need to go fast and we need to go far because it's a crisis yeah. and we need to be able to create solutions over the long haul. So what are you learning in your organizing about going fast and going far? In that, I mean, making you know, fast decisions, but also including the voices that need to be included. We're doing both, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing is I really struggle a lot when um, the mainstream climate movements, we were talking a lot about some of the bigger national organizations who mess a lot up because they're like, you know, this is urgent. Like, climate change is urgent. We just need to do things right. We're just going to, like, we need to steamroll over communities to have the outcome of our campaign happen. And you're like, well, like, climate change is urgent, which is why we don't have the time to mess up, because the more we mess up, the more we're not looking at the root causes. So the more we don't look at the root causes, we may be, like, fixing topical problems, but we're not actually changing the systems that are driving it. So, whereas, yes, we need to act fast, but, like, act fast in a way that's also not rushing through what our end goal is, but looking at the paths in way that, or, like, the ways that we get there. Um, and also, we don't like we don't have the answers to that. We're wrong a lot, and we learn a lot. And I think one of the big answers there is, um, you're not going to know everything, but people will let you know when something is wrong, and you have to take that for what it is. And the, these are the learning experiences that lead you along the way. And if you're not taking learning experiences.